can be made by males and females, but not a whole lot is made. It's nowhere near as much as the estrogens and progesterones made by the gun But very small amounts can be made, and we don't completely understand what they do or when they're made and how they work. So they're kind of on the they're kind of on the mysterious side. Okay. One more. And then we got the compressor out there in the bee boo bee boo running, so <clears throat> Okay. Anyway. And I might get louder as I go here. But I can't overdo it. Or those of you who have me in lab today, we won't have a lab. Mm -hmm. All right. We say that androgens may contribute to the onset of puberty and secondary sex characteristics. May, because we really don't know. Okay. We do seem to have unusual triggers for you know when somebody goes through puberty and they can't really, they can't seem to pin it on one hormone. The door I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm the door. Okay, now we do know what happens if somebody hypersecretes androgens. Okay, what we get is masculinization, also called virilization. If it's a man we're talking about, you'd never know the difference. Okay, hypersecretion of androgens in a male doesn't have any effect. They're more manly than the rest of the men. Doesn't really matter. But if we masculinize or, or virilize a female, we start to have a woman who will start to <coughs> display some of the secondary sex characteristics of men. Like you end up having a bearded lady. Okay? You end up having a woman with facial hair. Okay, and if it's if it if it happens young enough, you'll even have a girl who has more of a masculine body shape, broader shoulders and narrower hips, rather than than a feminine kind of um, um, of physique. And so, what we end up with is something called androgenital syndrome, in which we are we're kind of a little on the confused side. We've got a female body, but we have male characteristics. Um, the only thing in a male that hypersecretion would cause is if, it, if it's in a young male, um, precocious puberty, the onset of puberty might be early. But you know, other than that, you wouldn't really see any that, that we know of. We don't know of any difference. Okay, now, next, next organ here is the inside part of the adrenals. Remember, we We've been through the adrenal cortex now. We'll pay just a little bit of homage to the middle part, okay? Our medulla, <coughs> which we should know already, <coughs> makes chemicals called catecholamines, which are epinephrine and norepinephrine, okay? As a class of molecules, these, these two are called catecholamines. Okay, and we pretty much know what they do. We're talking about your fight or flight responses here. You know, and epinephrine and norepinephrine basically have about the same effects for what we need to know on you know on the target organs. They speed up heart rate, they increase breathing rate, um, uh, they slow down digestion, they increase awareness in the brain, okay? So and they they can also have a have a variety of other insidious effects with other hormones. If we get this, these, uh, like the um, uh, glucagon and epinephrine at the same time, we free up additional glucose. Again, for having an emergency, we need lots of sugar everywhere. So epinephrine is part of a lot of other cascade kind of reactions of, you know, if we have it and we have other hormones, then our, our effects are going to be combined. Okay, and we know that these hormones give us what are called sympathomimetic effects. They mimic the effects of the sympathetic n n nervous system. So if we're having a sympathetic effect, an event, we're having an emergency, then we're not only firing on sympathetic 
axons, but we're, but if we also get some epinephrine into the blood and get it everywhere, our effects are going to be enhanced. Again, sympathetic nervous system is going to increase heart rate and increase um, uh, breathing rate and all that stuff, as well as these hormones do. So if we have an emergency, we work at two levels. We work at the level of the sympathetic axons firing and also our extra added effect here of having these hormones being made. <clears throat> now, if we have a problem with the adrenal medulla, if we don't make enough catecholamines, it's usually not seen as being a problem, okay? These are not essential hormones. You just wouldn't get excited very easily, you know, or maybe at all. If something happens, you really would not get in, a, in as much of a panic mode as somebody who's making epinephrine, okay? So that's, it's not seen as being a medical problem. However, at the other end of, this, um, of the spectrum here, So Amanda came in, trying to see who's actually not here now. Erickson is the only one missing. Now Erickson and Willie. Chris Dodd is not here. My gentlemen are missing. Okay, everybody else is here. Erickson, Herman, <coughs> Willie, and Chris. Okay, all right, sorry. All right, now, again, at the other end of the spectrum, if we end up having a bizarre little tumor, little tumor inside the adrenal medulla is called a pheochromocytoma. If you watch House, he loves to say pheochromocytoma. Okay? Oh. A pheochromocytoma is a, it, it's, and it, it's because they're very hard to diagnose, they're very tiny, so they're very hard to visualize. You almost have to diagnose them by symptoms, and the symptoms are you have a massive uncontrolled sympathetic response. You are on go all the time, like you're in a panic mode and, and there's no reason for you to be because you're making, this little tumor makes copious amounts of epinephrine and norepinephrine and floods your body with it all the time, okay? So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be long and you would start to have other health problems because you have an increased heart rate and an increased breathing rate and high blood pressure and everything else and just be in a panic all the time and you wouldn't know why. Okay, make sure you know this, because this is a question I love to ask. Mm -hmm. What is a pheochromocytoma? It is a catecholamine or epinephrine and norepinephrine secreting tumor of the adrenal medulla. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Next little endocrine organ <coughs> is a really cool one <coughs> we don't know a whole lot about. Okay. The pineal gland. Remember we looked at the pineal when we studied the brain back in the epithalamus region. It's just a little spot. Okay, epithalamus. What it does, what, one thing that we know it does is it makes a hormone that is called melatonin. Okay, it probably makes a bunch of other things, but doesn't make much of anything because it's little. But it probably makes stuff that we only need a couple of molecules of here and there. We don't even completely know all the jobs of melatonin, but we do know that it has a lot to do with helping to interpret and regulate your daily rhythm, your diurnal rhythm, the rhythm around the day is what this means, okay? We know that at, at about midnight, me melatonin level is high, and in the middle of the day, me melatonin level is low, okay? We know that one of the effects of this hormone is to calm you down, okay? It's kind of like a natural sedative. So it's supposed to be high at night when you're supposed to be asleep. Okay, and then in the daytime we don't need it because we need to be awake. Okay, we do we do understand 